Stephen, you mentioned a lot about how morality gives us a reason for deterrence um, and a reason to feel um, indignant uh, when certain things happen. But I would be interested in hearing both of you speak to the role in the origin of forgiveness as a part of a moral code, because that is part of many people's moral code, that it is virtuous to forgive someone when they have wronged you. Um, and yet, that would seem to run contrary to the deterrence aspect and contrary to the, um, the indignance. So, in whichever, maybe Stephen first and then. I think it's a, a profound question, because if you forgive too readily, you do gut moral standards of any deterrent function. Uh, on the other hand, uh, if you never forgive, then um, you have uh, distorted the incentive structure so that, geez, if, I'm, uh, if I've already, if, if, if there's no such thing as forgiveness, if I just mess up once in my entire life and I'm ostracized by everyone for all eternity uh, or by the people that I, that I love, then there's, I no longer have any incentive to not be a, you know, a psychopath or a monster. Uh, there's got to be measured uh, condemnation, punishment, deterrence, up to the point where you create an atmosphere where people want to, to behave morally. You don't want to create, as they say, a moral, moral hazard in a very different sense of moral, namely a, um, a perverse incentive structure where people, kind of like what we have now in, in, in Wall Street, where we have maybe a little bit too much forgiveness. Uh, and the danger is, the reason it's called a moral hazard is you worry that if we forgive too quickly, then people will just go ahead and, uh, and act uh, self-interestedly the next time with no compunctions. But on the other hand, you don't want to have the, you know, the, the death penalty for, for littering. Um, so you, you want to measure it, uh, otherwise, and which is why, by the way, you can also see this in the evolution of criminal codes. One of the reasons for the abolition of these cruel punishments for trivial infractions, part of it, I think, is just an increase in, in um, empathy and universalism, but part of it is also is the realization that, gee, if you're going to uh, um, execute someone for stealing a loaf of bread, well, now he may as well murder the shopkeeper at the same time because both of them give him the death penalty. If he's just going to get uh, you know, a fine or a few months in jail for stealing a loaf of bread, then he'll think twice about also killing the store owner. So by calibrating the punishment with the forgiveness, the leniency, the mercy, uh, you've got a system that is m much better all around. Forgiveness is a fantastically interesting subject and a fantastically important dimension of human existence. And if you really think about it, it gets right down to the very core of morality because we all know the internal experience of having done something wrong or wronged another person. We even feel sometimes that we do things wrong that don't hurt other people as being irreverent, for example, or, or uttering bad words, even if nobody hears them. I, I don't mean swear words, I mean condemnations or, or crudities that, that we just feel we exist within a realm where there's something, something uh, called righteousness, which just means right ordering, by the way. It, it's, you know, my experience was righteousness was either a bunch of, of very hard, Bible-thumping kind of people, or being at Stanford in the late 60s, early 70s, there was something called a righteous joint. I don't know if, <laughs> but, but, but righteous is a beautiful word. It means the right ordering of things. We all have much that needs forgiving. And yet, we can't forgive ourselves. Anybody in medicine knows that's a major problem. And many people can't forgive other people. And look at the reconciliation efforts in South Africa. It took a lot of patience. I think right at the heart of the existential dilemma of, more, of the moral mind is the, the question of, is there forgiveness? And it's one of the things that the, the, the law, I mean, Stephen speaks rightly and well of the power of interchangeability, and I certainly affirm that. And by the way, you're bordering very close toward natural law philosophy there, which is, which is okay with me. I think there's something to that. But having said that, you, it's, it's not enough, Stephen. I mean, it's, look at history. If it were logical and it were interchangeable, people could always have done it. Why was there slavery? 
Uh, why are there so many bad things in the world? And why, given the moral law that it says in the Bible is written on our hearts to some extent, not necessarily through any kind of divine revelation except in the general production of the cosmos. Given that, why is it that human beings do not behave morally? What's the explanation for it? And one of the explanations is because once they've made some error or have some sense of not measuring up, they feel unforgiven inside. Forgiveness is the very heart of it. For more information about the Veritas Forum, including additional recordings and a calendar of upcoming events, please visit our website at veritas.org.